we have um, probably the biggest usable privacy and security group here. We also have a large group of people interested at the intersection of AI <coughs> and security and privacy. Um, we have a lot of people that are kind of on the edge and not just um, uh, working you know, in, the, in the central domain, but actually in lots of domain areas where they're bringing security and privacy into various domain areas. Uh, so that, that makes things really exciting um, here at CMU. Uh, in general at CMU, I think we especially pride ourselves on our impact on the world. And there's a lot of ways that we make uh, an impact on the world, whether it's through teaching students or uh, having our research adopted uh, you know, in standards, going out into um, big companies, uh, but also spinning off startup companies. Uh, and we've, we've had a few uh, very successful um, startups in the security and privacy space. We've had a lot more in other spaces at CMU, including robotics and machine learning. Uh, but I think there's a growing interest in having more security and privacy, uh, cybersecurity startups at CMU, and thus the, this event. Um, I think, I think that this uh, can be a really exciting uh, adventure. Um, I know many of you in the room have already been involved in startups, but there are a few new faces of people who I think are dipping your toe in the water and interested in, in checking this out. And, um, and I, I, uh, I hope you will, will uh, decide to jump in. And so today, we're going to hear from a variety of people, including some of our colleagues here, as well as some uh, some, some outside uh, visitors who we have, we have brought in uh, because we think they all have interesting stories to tell you. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll hear from um, our founders panel about their motivations, strategies, lessons learned, and then also our funders panel on the trends that they're seeing in the marketplace and their advice for potential founders. Um, as I said, this is, this is the kickoff for a series of events. So we are expecting to have a variety of other events coming up. Um, we're looking at having um, an event with chief information security officers discussing their unmet needs, um, as well as other workshops on various aspects of the startup um, process. So uh, to, to get us started, I want to find out kind of who is in the room and what your interests are. Um, so we're going to do a quick going around the room and have everybody just uh, introduce themselves and let us know kind of what aspect of security, privacy, cybersecurity you are particularly interested in. So a lot of you, so we'll, we'll do it quickly. Um, so let's see. Why don't we start in the back corner over there? My name is Ralph Lucero. I'm with uh, VP of Sales at Wombat, and I'm looking for interest in other cybersecurity companies that are looking to go to business. Software Engineering Institute uh, here at C. What we can do to better motivate and get our researchers to start thinking more with startup mentality on how they might have other possibilities for uh, the marketplace. Oh, back there, yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm 
management faculty in uh, EPP and uh, SPS and at Skylab. Um, I do security measurement, mostly security analytics. And we uh, join with uh, the Yarko in the water and uh, trying to solve something. Yeah, I'm Jared Thomas. I work as a software engineer in Skylab. So we're doing all the same projects. Kip Nagar, I'm with the Short Center for Project Olympus. We started the incubator program for CMU. So I am a resource for every one of you who just wants to explore um, starting the business. So I'll talk more later. Phil Compton, I've actually co-founded a cybersecurity company back in 2012, sold it in 2015, and this year we're here. Right here, I guess. Oh, yeah. hi. hi, I'm John Funge. Uh, I'm with uh, Data Tribe. Uh, we're a DC-based, uh, early stage, seed stage investor, um, and uh, in, we do about 80% of our investing in cybersecurity, uh, and we are optimized really for working with extremely technical founders. We, we are located close to Fort Meade specifically uh, to find uh, those great technologists. We see a lot of similarity with the great technology and capability of CMU. I'm here, I'd love to meet people that are interested and have great ideas to create startups. I'm Ann Bonaparte, uh, ex-CEO of F-Authority. We were just acquired by Symantec. Uh, I'm Peter Finley. I was a part of the founding team of a company called Observable Network. We sold Cisco about a year and a half ago. I'm Mario Savides. I'm a veterinary DC in Skylab. I have a startup called Hawkshot with Mario Bell Bosanova. I'm also a GPA in Santa Cruz Bosanova. Hi, I'm Jacob Feldmuller. My name is Gina Harito Sanikis. I'm a director of the Information Networking Institute here at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm one of the founding directors of Scilab. Um, several of my students have successfully launched startups in cybersecurity and other areas, and I'm here to, um, well, I'm also president of Chensi's fan club. <laughs> but I'm here to learn more about, you know, those critical criteria that funding agencies, VCs, look for in funding startups. I'm Chen Si Wang. Um, I actually was a former faculty here at ECE, Scilab, and, and affiliated with INI. Um, right now, I founded and, and, and uh, am running a uh, cybersecurity focused fund. I'm the GP for the fund, so it's interesting to come back and look at the technologies being built here and hope to uh, have more collaboration with everyone. I'm Alex Seber. Um, I used to be a PhD student in Salab, and I left to create a company called Forward Secure, uh, where we find bugs in, in binary software. Uh, Tyler Rounding, I'm a director at a local security integration company called Intertech, and former DOD, and I'm interested to learn about the companies on the panel today. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael LaFonte. I lead partnerships for Scilab and help put this together along with our, our partners here on campus. And Really, I'm here to understand both sides, what our faculty and students are looking for, as well as industry, so I can continue to make those connections. I'm Rick Fanagal. I work at the Technology Transfer Office, CTEC, at Carnegie Mellon. I helped put this event together, trying to help our researchers who are thinking about commercialization have a better understanding of what that path forward is. I'm Dave Mawinney. I'm a CMU alum, serial entrepreneur and investor. I run the Smith Center, and we're here to help you achieve your dreams, right? education, ex access to experts and networks, access to capital, that's what we try to help you with. So hopefully we'll get some people excited about some new cybersecurity startups. Zach Malone with Draper Triangle Ventures. We're an early stage venture firm based here in Pittsburgh. Um, I guess I'm here always looking for opportunities to invest in, but also meet great people. Um, I feel like I get a little bit smarter every time I come here, so. Norman, oh, sorry. Um, Norman Sede, Professor of Computer Science and a member of Scilab, uh, working in AI, security, privacy, mobile and IoT, and uh, former uh, chairman and founding CEO of uh, Wombat Security Technologies. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Hazelbaker. I'm currently a student in uh, the INI studying information security. And before coming here, I worked in a startup venture fund in Florida called the Fan Fund, and I really loved it. 
So one of my goals ever since has been to uh, start my own computer security company. So I've been working on one, uh, an idea to provide computer security training materials for businesses to provide to their employees. So thank you. Peter. Peter. All right, come on up. So I went to mistake. He makes some mistakes. <laughs> um, so uh, the um, and I, I think that covers it. Um, Alex uh, Rivera, uh, as you heard a moment ago, is the is a co-founder of For All Secure, uh, located right around the corner. For All Secure, for those of you who don't know, won the, uh, the DARPA challenge, uh, the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge in 2016. Uh, he completed his master's um, in computer science here at, at CMU and uh, left. Norman Sade, you uh, is probably very well known to this audience, a uh, co-founder of Wombat um, with other people in the room, and uh, uh, also a professor of, of artificial intelligence principally at, uh, here at CMU. Uh, and Bonaparte um, is a, uh, a, a genuine Silicon Valley CEO uh, and has, has, um, uh, has uh, uh, not just completed her, her, uh, her, re her most recent uh, startup and, and exit um, to Symantec um, about a little less than a year ago, but um, has been CEO of a number of companies, probably three or four cybersecurity companies, and, uh, and can bring some valuable uh, experience uh, and intuition and knowledge of how that all works uh, to people who are wondering how Pittsburgh fits into the uh, broader national um, cybersecurity picture. Um, I'm Peter Finley. I've done a little bit of work in, in cybersecurity startups, and my job is to moderate this panel and keep us moving. So uh, let me ask the first question, which is, uh, most, uh, most cybersecurity companies uh, either succeed or fail based on the, uh, among other things, among, on the, uh, the size of the problem they choose to address. Um, I'm very interested in hearing uh, uh, from founders about how they selected the problem that they addressed and uh, how much customer engagement they had in that process early on. And Norman, would you start us off? As a sure. Um, so when uh, we started Wombat, this was in uh, 2008, and obviously you start working on these things a little bit before you officially incorporate, I was actually looking at three different sets of technology to commercialize. And I thought that all three of them were interesting. The, the one I think that was different about, and so they were in very different spaces. One had to do with mobile and privacy. One had to do with supply chain and automated trading technology. And the third one had to do with what we ended up commercializing with Wombat, cybersecurity, uh, training and awareness uh, technologies. Uh, the one thing that motivated me to start Wombat with my co-founders had to do with the fact that uh, we saw real demand for these technologies to the point that people were actually calling us at Carnegie Mellon and saying, how can we license your technology? And to me, that was a, a very strong sign that we're onto uh, something. So uh, we obviously uh, analyzed things very carefully. I was a co-director for MBA Tracking Technology Leadership, so I had a bit of insight into what, what are the sorts of things that you want to look at in terms of size of the market and those kinds of things. And uh, everything looked very promising. Uh, and uh, obviously, as we started the company, we also worked towards further expanding our addressable market by supplementing the technologies we licensed from Carnegie Mellon, developing additional complementary products that were able to cross-sell and upsell thanks to uh, people like our VP of Sales, who is standing there in the back. And so. Uh, so that, that's, that's a quick story. I don't want to take more time than, than I should. I, I, 
curious about how you engage the first set of customers that you had. Uh, right. So, like I said, the first two uh, organizations came to us. We said you had read actually about four articles, and that's truly exceptional. That's not typically uh, the avenue that you would expect someone to, uh, to follow. But we're getting enough publicity in the press. Uh, CFU has a pretty good marketing uh, machine in place, and so we're getting some exposure in the press just based on our research. Uh, the first uh, sale uh, was basically converting one of those inquiries that we got from CMU into a customer. We uh, incorporated in June of uh, 2008. By mid-August, uh, I had my first customer. It was actually a bank in Italy. I had failed to secure a few others because I had priced things wrong. And so you do a little bit of trial and error, and then when you get it right, you get that first customer. These were interesting times. This was obviously, uh, you know, the, the financial crisis of 2008 hit us very quickly. But we continued to actually sell through that at a very slow pace. But sales were continuing, and people were actually quite impressed uh, by that. And then obviously when things came back to normal, quote unquote, uh, things started to pick up. And, and uh, we're smart with our money, and I don't want to you know, uh, tell the whole story here, but we're very smart, very nimble uh, in the early in our early years. The market was not fully ready for us. It was really the early adopters that came on board. Things started to turn wrong uh, around 2011, 2012. We had secured uh, some SBR money. Uh, we were starting to see more mainstream customers coming to us, and that's when we started ramping up and raising more money. Oh, that's great. Um, Alex, same question. You, uh, when when Coral Secure won the um, the Cyber Challenge, the DARPA Cyber Challenge in 2016, you were already uh, uh, your your own private company. Can you talk a little bit about how you selected the problem and and uh, how you engaged with customers early on? Yeah, um, the story is. Very similar actually. So I was a PhD student uh, in Salah working with David Thornley on program analysis, and we had this tool that could find bugs in software and we published papers. And we started getting inquiries about, hey, can we use your tool? We'd like to see if our software has bugs. Um, so we had a discussion with David Thornley and the third co founder, and we decided to start the company to see um, if there's a market here. Uh, and those inquiries, um, same same as the story that you just heard is how we converted our first customers. It ended up being for something that has nothing to do with what we do now, uh, but it was you know, a research project from CMU, and we had the R&D to, to do our first sales and, and get some seed money that way. Um, Marcus, you've, you've been involved with two startups, Hawksai and Bossa Nova, and possibly more. Um, sure. Can you talk a little bit same question? Sure, so uh, Hawksai uh, was one of my uh, first sort of uh, Successes. And it was an interesting story. One of my previous master's students came to me who was for funding. He said, you know, an investor that approached him, he's a smart guy. He said, you know, let's do something. And he said, okay. And he called as my advisor. He came to me and he, he wanted to basically commercialize face recognition on home security cameras. The investor was a ODM. They built camera manufacturers. And, and so the, the channel was there. And I think that's an advantage if, you, if your investor is someone who already has a channel in place easier to get the technology get adopted. Um, I told him, Andy, this is going to fail. Uh, don't even start this. We don't have the computing power. Uh, as much as I wanted to, I knew we were not ready. I said, and you know, security is something that we always, I always loved, and I was more physical security and home security. And having gone through myriads of home security cameras and searching through thousands of false alarms every day of a tree moving or a snowflake coming in front and causing a trigger, I was tired of all that. I said, first thing we got to do, Andy, is a better AI to make these cameras more robust. Because right now, back in 2013, they were utterly useless. You would have a full hard drive full of just tree the, the, need, the sun moving was enough to cause an alert. So we were the first to actually build smart AI that we implemented and got adopted in legacy hardware. We did not wait for sort of the embedded SOCs and the new neural chips and so forth. We were just able to load efficient AI algorithms to basically firmware update onto legacy cameras. And you know, there's over a million ADP cameras we got first adopted by running our technology uh, to just firmware update. And so that's where we started, and then we grew, and you know, we had a successful exit in a completely different market. Talk about some of the bumps later. <laughs> I, I'd love to hear more about the uh, sort of initial customer set. How did you think about that? And so we were fortunate. The, the, the investor had the channel. 
So they already were supplying cameras for ADP, Comcast, Verizon. So the, the customer base was there, there was just, there were no brains. You had this shell, you had this front-end device, but there were no brains. So it was easy. It was something we added value, and with just the initial first round of funding from them, we were able to get recurring licensing back in the company that kept us self-sustained. And I think that's something that is important to think about. You know, when you go to a startup, you can find an investor who already has a channel to your customers. You already have a business plan and you have a way to get out. They're gonna help you, they're gonna want you to succeed. So they'll do a lot of the marketing that you won't have to unless you know you have to build that up. So be strategic in who you get to who invest you. Find a company that has a VC arm that you're naturally fit, they will ensure your success with. I think that was a big help to what we did. And I saved you for last because oh. you don't have the same, same kind of CMU DNA that everybody else here does. Can oh. you talk a little bit about anyone well, at the company you've been involved with? Well, I was thinking about um, Mail Frontier, which was one of the early email security companies. And um, we, you know, back then it's hard to imagine now, but spam was still a, a big problem in early two, 2000, 2001. And um, we, we, our team built a um, consumer product and it was really great and we put it out so it was solving a problem we all understood because we were annoyed with with it but what was interesting um it was downloaded you know by a, mostly tech guys because we you know it was early days and that's where they found it and they are the ones it was those individuals that brought it into their company and then people began to buy it individually but we hadn't even imagined an enterprise license and how to think about that. And then we realized from a business model perspective that was a much uh, more efficient way to go rather than spending a whole bunch on consumer. And so then we ended up flipping the model and giving the consumer product away for free. And then, um, you know, and that drove us into the enterprises. And, and then, you know, we, we had pretty great growth after that. And, um, so, so, you, so you did a pivot from consumer to... Yeah, well, we, but we always kept that consumer product, but we, that's not where we were going to make the money. You know, when we first imagined that's where we'd make money is selling it, and we realized, no, if we seeded the market, that would seed the market, and that would ended up driving a lot of enterprise um, penetration and then into a licensing to sort of manage it. So it was sort of a backdoor. I don't know if it was a pivot as much as a backdoor to a new, more robust business model. Right, yeah. Trojan horse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's a good question for the rest of the panel, which is um, any any experience with pivots, um, or were you fortunate enough to be able to execute on your original idea all the way through? So we didn't pivot, but we added to our product line. So uh, we licensed technology from CMU, and as best as we could judge, uh, this technology was probably going to get us to an addressable market of about half a billion dollars. So the question for us was not so much what we change about that product, and that product turned out to be very successful, and uh, pretty much all our customers uh, used it and probably continue to use it, uh, no longer as a, as a company, uh, but, uh, but we realized also that if we wanted to be more exciting, we had to sort of build a more extensive uh, suite of, of products. And so for those of you who don't know much about Wombat, uh, the initial product was actually just a phishing game. It was a game to teach people how to parse URLs, and recognize phishing emails where there would be a link that would be a malicious link. And so that has been very successful. This was addressing a real need. We had developed a technique to train people in a matter of minutes to parse these things much more effectively. And so the question, what else can we build and you know, what else can we sell to these companies? And so we extended the product line, focused initially on phishing, and then recognized that the approach we had could be extended to deal with a number of other cybersecurity issues going to mobile, social networking, security outside of the office, moving on even to our compliance, HIPAA and the like. And so that suite of products extended uh, the addressable market quite significantly to a multi-billion dollar market. We still don't know how big it is, but it's certainly uh, in, in the billions uh, these days. And, and so we didn't really pivot, but we certainly had to think strategically about how to grow the market, how to differentiate ourselves from similar offerings that were off available for free. There were other cybersecurity games, so the main difference uh, that we recognize was how do we uh, build a whole infrastructure for companies to actually track performance, see how well their employees are doing. There were a number of additional things that were extremely valuable uh, to companies, to CISOs when they would go and present to the board that uh, were not available in these new products. And so 
that was uh, what was driving our product development at that point. Great. And, and if I if I can paraphrase what you were saying, uh, you were you really going got to the same customers. You were offering them more products. That's correct. Uh, in their, in their, in your that's, market. that's correct. And that's still the story of our acquisition. When we got acquired, we got acquired by a company that had very complementary products, uh, some overlapping customers, but they realized that many of their customers didn't have a product. Same thing with the customers. We want to make sure we offered something that wasn't out there because we took it from funding to try three different ideas and wait for one of them. So we went after doing AI on the edge. We didn't, you know, most of the companies doing uh, home security cameras would send things to the cloud. And everyone was doing that. So the only way it would be different is let's get low power AI, efficient algorithms that would run on 300 to 500 megahertz CPUs and only utilize 30% of that so that you know, we're not taking up any more of the processing power and legacy hardware. So we were able to do that efficiently and I think that, that gave us a niche that, that allowed us to you know, penetrate the market and, and grow. Um, we did pivot in acquisition, so we got acquired by a company that built robots <laughs> because the IP we have is multi-purpose. You know, that can keep little cars, big products, with other things. So that was, that was, I think, a pivoting story in our end that we're thinking of same IP that we had, and we're now doing it for robots. And I think from Bossa Nova side, even though it wasn't, you know, my, my uh, CTO, Sarjun, was the co-founder, they had a pivoting story. I mean, they started building robot uh, toys. Bossa Nova initially was actually making toys. And they pivoted and <coughs> basically realized that it's a very brutal cutthroat market, and, you know, you lost marketing to big companies like Activision. I mean, I have a great toy, I mean, a toy that was way above anything out there, but if you didn't have the right marketing and right positioning in stores, you lost, so, you so, know. So you went after Walmart, which is uh, they went a, a bit of a predator. They kind of came, they kind of came, <laughs> knocked on the door, and they didn't take much of it, and then that just opened up this whole new veteran retail. So, you know, pivoting happens when you least expect it and, and embrace it because it's what's going to save and create a new direction. Great. Um, I, I, I looked at address this issue of customer value proposition, um, and Anne, if I can address this to you. Um, how did you, th th there's, a, there's a rule in startups that you gotta offer 10 times better value than, the, than your best competitor. Um, and uh, uh, either, either better performance at a much lower cost, or you know, <laughs> cost, et cetera, or, or a much lower cost for some performance. Is there, um, can, can you talk a little bit about a, uh, an experience you had where you were able to uh, identify Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a, a couple. I am thinking, the, like the company I founded, which was not a cybersecurity company, was all about online project collaboration uh, in like 1999, so a long time ago. And it was for the architectural engineering computing space. And at that time, people were still shipping drawings and doing their file sharing, you know, with AutoCAD drawings, you know, with paper. And it was like, really, you know, we need to move to the internet. And so we provided this um, opportunity to not only do project collaboration, but be able to measure and interact with uh, these design files to make, you know, faster and better decisions. So, I mean, it definitely was more than 50 X or 10 X. I mean, it was, it was a, just a transformational way to um, share data among you know, engineers, architects, owners, the government, all the people involved in a building project, there's no such thing as an enterprise. So I don't know, for me that, you know, it's 100X. I mean, so I guess for me, most of my companies have, are solving problems that, with a whole different way. So it's not just like this much improvement, it's just you sort of trash the old process. But that has its challenges, getting everybody to get online. And so, I mean, to be able to make that leap, you know, it's actually harder than just an incremental, do it a little bit different. You actually change the way they're working. Or even my last one, authority, you know, we were, we were solving, you know, making sure enterprises could trust employees bringing their mobile devices to the enterprise. So we were doing deep mobile application analysis, which just didn't exist before. 
So again, it's it's hard to put an X measurement against that because they were just flying blind. So yeah. I don't know if those are maybe true. So when, when we started Wombat uh, in 2008, there were something like five or 700 uh, cybersecurity startups already that were VC funded. Uh, I don't have the exact figures, but I believe that number has roughly doubled if you look today. It's over a thousand. The end result is that CISOs are inundated with uh, phone calls, emails. I mean, they're going completely crazy. If you want to get their attention, you need to have a very clear uh, value proposition. Otherwise, they're just going to dismiss you. Uh, and so when we uh, started Wombat, uh, we had written some sent-to papers <coughs> that showed that, hey, our staff, so we had, for instance, these fake phishing emails we sent to, uh, to, uh, to users, and then uh, if they fell for these fake phishing emails, we would use this as a teachable moment, popping up some training, getting their attention. They would be properly motivated to pay attention, and we're able to show that uh, you know, a very large percentage of the time, people would actually retain something that they had taught them, which in contrast to the more traditional types of solutions, bring people in the room, lecturing them, email to the system administrators, and, and the like. But eventually, and that works fine for the very, very early adopters. But eventually, if you want to turn this into what became eventually the de facto solution to train people to not fall for phishing attacks, you need to have a much more robust return on investment uh, proposition. And so in our case, we're able to work with the Fundamental Institute to discuss this over lunchtime, right. hire them, and uh, you know, there are clearly lots of different costs when you fall for an attack like a phishing attack. We ended up just focusing on a tiny piece of, of, uh, of the, the, the downside of falling for an attack, which is basically the process of cleaning up the machine. Right? So not you know, the IP that gets stolen and all, all the bad things that happen as a result of that. Just the cost of cleaning up the machine. We're able to show that we had a 50, 50x return on investment in one year. That really made a huge difference. So to this day, if you go to the, you know, the Proofpoint website, you're still gonna find these reports. That clearly sells, that speaks to people. These CISOs, they don't know what to look at. They've, they've got a budget, it keeps on growing, but you see, it, it's not infinite money. They have to work very hard at growing that budget. The board is clearly recognizing that cybersecurity is a major issue. But you need to have a very clear value proposition for them to just go beyond the step of listening to you and actually making that purchase. Well, 50X is uh, extraordinary, and I, it helps explain why you were able to, to grow your sales Absolutely. at the rate you were. Um, and and it's, it's also, as Dan indicated, it's also unusual so early and to have somebody on the outside validate them. But when you can, it, it really it helps your business. It does, it does. Great. Any other stories or should we move on to the next question? Um, yeah, I wanted to follow up on, on that. So you mentioned you know you have to show that you have 10x value your competitors, but if you have something that um, is different enough and find different issues, you might not have to compare yourself as much against the other players in the field, but what is the cost of not finding it so if you have a bug, it goes into production, can you get hacked with the expenses? But if you can demonstrate that the kind of issue that you can find and you can actually swap out or, or some, something like that, find a bug that would be costly for a customer to um, be hacked uh, for that. Um, that's another way to show the value proposition. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, organizational behavior very early on when you found a problem you want to uh, deal with and, um, and talk about uh, degrees of ownership and first money. There's a whole lot of uh, issues there, but maybe I could narrow it down initially to talk to, to say, uh, to ask about um, how you draw together the team you want and how you talk to each other about um, about the ownership of the business going forward. Can, uh, I'll point that to anybody who wants to take that question. I assume you're referring to the very early stage of, of starting a company, but that remains actually true as you grow and as you hire uh, additional people. So for instance, uh, after our Series B, we finally hired a CFO, and, and that was obviously a very different uh, conversation. But uh, in the very early days, the conversation, for instance, among the founders had to do not just, uh, and this is, you know, I think it's important given that there are a number of faculty in this room to sort of uh, dispel some, some, some myths potentially, right? So we tend, I'm a faculty myself, we tend to think that we invent these ideas and that the idea by itself will change the world and that everything else, you know, is easy. You just hire, a, you know, a CEO or you hire a bunch of salespeople and it automatically happens, right? There's no effort involved, right? Nothing could be farther from the truth. And so uh, one of the discussions we had early on uh, with my co 
founders was, well, how much work are you actually going to put into this company? What role do you expect to see yourself playing over the years? Or for how many years do you see yourself sticking with the company? How early do you want to move on and actually do something else? Right? And that conversation led us to a better understanding of you know, what our commitments were, what were also the gaps in the initial team, who would want to hire initially, how that translated to equity that different people would, would get, the number of years it would take for people to invest. Clearly, you don't want to give equity to people up front. You want to make sure it's a genuine commitment. Plans change, right? And people often don't realize that. I, uh, I've worked with Dave Mawini uh, over, I think, 10 years, where uh, he was helping with the MBA track in technology leadership and would talk to all these companies that would start some of them success stories. And one of the things that you see over and over again is people assuming that, hey, I should get 25% of the company because it's me and I invented this, and don't expect me to do anything beyond today, right? Uh, and, and so you gotta really dispel that and explain to people, look, it's gonna take many, many years, it's gonna take a lot of sweat and effort, and you may have some unique value, it doesn't have to be proportional to the amount of time you put into the company, but you really have to see what it is that's going to bring this company over the years, and you've got to see who else you need for this company to be successful. And on that basis, figure what is the right way of apportioning uh, equity in company. Yeah, and I want to add exactly what Robin mentioned. You know, we have this bias, right, we need to build great technology. But honestly, it's meaningless when you have somebody who can actually show its value and get it sold. So in, in my sense, we were equal with my, with my student, you know, the CEO, Andy. He was out there, he was knocking on doors, Parity, Comcast, he went after all his companies, get POCs running, follow up. I mean, I I don't know how he did it. There was no way I could do 1% of what he did. So having the right business partner who is out there knocking on doors, doors that don't want to be open, get into the, just try this, follow up, and do this on multiple fronts because you can't put all your eggs in one basket. I mean, that's what sort of technology. You can have great technology, but if you can't get it out to the right people. Yeah, the, sorry. Go the, the equity is, <coughs> can be a difficult conversation to have. Um, you can get person about, you know, who is more valuable than who. Um, and and you, you have plenty of advice uh, today, and I think the thing is great. I would, I would add maybe get, getting some outside help. Uh, someone that has done it before, or someone that has seen that process many times, like for recording boost, of previous um, startup or hub uh, that could help you through the process of who it is that what. Great, can you talk a little bit about the money, um, the early money? Um, in particular, there's, a, there's usually an array of, of non-dilutive grant type money, um, actual money that wants a ownership in the business, uh, so on and so forth. Can you talk about when you approach what kinds of, of uh, potential investors you met or grantors you met? Okay, all right, okay, it sounds like we've you know, adopted yeah. a, a pattern here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna repeat some of the things we talked about over lunch. It's okay. gonna feel repetitive as I speak, but I'll, I'll try to ignore that. Uh, so uh, what are the things that uh, you know you, you, you wanna do is, and we got some seed money, uh, so Simu was very generous. I think they gave us 20K when we started. It doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it pays the bill, uh, legal bills, and it allows you to hire a few part-time people. You wanna be very, very, very smart with your money the early days. Uh, one of the things that I strongly believe in is that you should only raise you know, as much money as you need and you should raise it obviously at the right time. Uh, you hear a lot of people bragging about the fact that they've raised you know, tens of millions of dollars. I don't necessarily view this as being a sign of success. I mean, sometimes this is the right thing to do and you do need to scale up, no <coughs> question. But sometimes that's not necessarily the best thing to do, whether it's for you as a founder, whether it's for your employees, and potentially even for your investors. So at Wombat, uh, the early days were actually fairly slow. The market was not entirely ready for technology, and it was a bit of a blessing in disguise that we got the financial crisis. It gives us a chance to uh, gain more credibility, work with these early customers that we got, and then even over time, the market matured. Uh, people, fishing became worse, we uh, became better known, we started building a name for ourselves, and uh, the market was ready to pick up. How did we survive during these uh, first three years? We were lucky enough to get uh, four SBIRs, so we got $1.7 million in non-diluted non SBIR money, money that was perfectly aligned with our roadmap, so we didn't have to deviate by one iota from what we're planning to do in any case, which is sort of your ideal scenario. SBIR money is very heavy, right? So if you 
got to go after SBR money just for the sake of getting money. Honestly, don't do it, right? It's a mistake. In our case, this was perfectly aligned with what we wanted to do. We got it, we're very lucky. And then as we uh, start to see an increase in sales, as we start to identify some of the events, we were actually quite successful. We found this event organized by Eventa. Uh, that was a huge success for us. We'd go there and within weeks, we had already paid the, the cost of attending the event and then obviously more customers would come. So once we reach that point, it was really time to say, okay, there's really a market here. We can see it, it's happening. We need to beef up the sales force. We need to have more people reporting to Ralph here. And so that's when we started raising more money. But we're always very careful. At the end of the day, we raised about $12 million in total. Uh, and uh, many of the competitors raised multiples of that. And it didn't necessarily get much farther than we did. Yeah. I mean, I would agree that the constraints, you know, like in any design process make, you know, for better decisions. And um, I mean, a mistake that I made at one of our companies is we got sort of attracted to the shiny ball of some government funding, you know, that looked like non-dilutive. So we're like, ooh, that's going to be great, you know. But it, it changed our roadmap. And um, we really not only, we just lost some time and time you can't make up, you know. And, um, you know, there were, L and we would, honestly, we would tell ourselves, oh, well, but we need, you know, 70% of this. But the reality that even that 30% that was off track uh, was a mistake, and uh, it, we, we lost some time. So I think it's being very um, and very honest with yourself about that alignment, because it's, it's rare that it's perfectly aligned, you know, this sort of free money and that, that is not dilutive. So I just, I would take it if you can get it, but I, I know I, for one, have, have made a mistake or two on that, and, and, and you can't make up the time. And you're, you're the sort of person Venture investors will sometimes bring you to run a business. You've done that more than once. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, about what what makes a good uh, investor, what makes a not so great investor? Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I've, I've had the fortune of having just all hundred percent great investors. You know, for anybody that's going to see this uh, show. Uh, no, I think the I, I actually have had great investors. So one, they. Uh, they're great. I mean, they're 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 incredible listeners. Uh, they ask the the hardest question that I hadn't thought about. You know, so they 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 are very smart about their segments. I really like cyber focus. You know, if I'm running a cyber company, I'd rather I'd like to have somebody that <laughs> understands not just because of the network, which I have found to be less frankly less helpful. They've never really helped me get deals or anything. <coughs> But they, um, because of the volume of the deals they see, they have a market awareness that I, as running a company, can never have because I got my head down and I'm running. But they're able to see all the incoming deals, so they're able to sort of have a sense where some of the weak spots or where some of the opportunities in the market are. So I find focused um, segment investors the most valuable. And then the ones that are not, um, you know, they don't. I've never had one try to micromanage a company or think that, <laughs> I've never had that, but I've heard horror stories from others, but I fortunately have never had that. Any others uh, responses on that? So I think one thing about investors, is obviously not all, not all investors are equal. And I think more so beyond the type of investor, if you have an investor, in our case, you know, car manufacturer that came to us, they, they took a huge chunk of our company. That was okay because in return, we had a channel. We already had a customer base, right? We already had a distribution. So that made a, a lot of life easier. So that was a trade-off that we were accept that was okay for us. So you gotta think about, you know, it's not just the money, but as an investor, give you access to customers. Do they have other companies in the portfolio that will help you succeed? So there are a lot of factors that you should take into account if you're an investor beyond whether an angel or a VC or whatever. And there's a trade-off in, in that, and you know, I think taking all that factors into account can help you succeed in this case. Okay. Uh, I think we're coming close to the end of this panel, so I'll probably try to keep it keep this short. Um, I, I have to ask the, the question everybody asks, uh, the, the sort of standard interview question, which is, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? Before you started your business, what do you wish you, you knew that you know now? And I will leave that open for anybody. learned a lot. In our case, from about 10 years from founding to exit. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, 
very hard to summarize everything that we learned. One thing that I probably did realize is that this was eight and a years when we started. We tend to be much more optimistic. Uh, and uh, in truth, 10 years is actually pretty fast for many companies. There are companies that take longer. Uh, one thing to understand, and, and uh, people honestly know this until they start companies, there's a huge difference between B2C and B2B. Right? B2B companies where a software as a service company, they take a long time to nurture. Uh, there are actually articles that have been written about how fast you can drive a software as a service company. There are people who have actually written these articles looking at how much uh, sales uh, you, you generate, how many additional sales people you can hire, to actually formulate what your sales cycle is. And uh, by and large, we're pretty much always operating at maximum speed at, at Wombat. And it still took us 10 years to get there. Right? And so that was something that I was not completely aware of, the fact that these multiples, when it comes to B2B <coughs> companies, uh, tend to be fairly rational on the whole. I mean, obviously, there are times in the market when things are a bit better and times when they're a bit worse. But people will not go crazy and give you absolutely uh, irrational evaluations, as you might have actually seen a bit more, at least. And, and that's maybe speaking because of lack of information. But in B2C, it seems to be a lot more subjective. Right? In B2B, you know, uh, there's no magic. You just have to do, you've got to do your work. You've got to put in the sweat equity. That's something that uh, perhaps I was a bit naive about, honestly. And when we started, I learned as we went. I learned a tremendous amount. Every year, our company was different. And I had to sort of figure who to interact with, what my priorities were, how to make sure I was not the bottleneck. All these things are, are things that uh, you learn as you go. And, and uh, you know, that, that's, uh, those are something that I can share. Thank you. Alex? So, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, I guess there's two things that I wish. I found valuable in this one. The first one was, don't get distracted. People have talked about using government funding um, to boost up your startup. Um, this has been incredibly useful for Power CTO, and we would not have survived without it. Uh, but we lost a lot of time because it wasn't aligned to exactly what we wanted to do. And the second thing is, um, get feedback from your customers. You might have an idea of what they want. And I mean, you hear that at every panel, I'm sure, but you really gotta talk to them and understand their needs. And they might tell you something Another one might tell you say something very different and come up to uh, synthesize uh, what they really want. Uh, but you got to talk to them. So I think something that I wish I knew, and I also kind of wish I did I knew, because sometimes when you know too much, you don't start an endeavor. Um, you know, you build a company and your goal is like, okay, someone's going to acquire it. And you think, okay, the end goal is here. No, that's when the real fight starts. That's when. That's when things really start. So then it was like you're flying at 10,000 feet and no bumps. So we had four attempts, four times we were nearly acquired. The first time, we had someone who was not really interested in acquiring it. They gave us a high number. What they really wanted to do is go in due diligence, figure out what we were doing for our customers, cut all our contracts, bleed us dry, and then get us for very, very cheap. Uh, which is very dangerous and it's very real because they don't want you to sign up with a competitor. At the same time, if you do that, you're, if you don't if you do not do that, then they're more interested. But if you do that, you're kind of left hanging dry. So you've got to protect yourself and you've got to second guess everything. Um, we had another near deal we worked for four months. Um, everything was ready and suddenly they come into final negotiation and they drop the price to almost 30% of what it was originally. What the heck is this? You know, so it's it's a rocky ride. Make sure you have a lot of legal fees reserved for <laughs> lawyers, um, and let the games begin. But you got to be savvy. You know, I think and Norman mentioned this before in here. You know, in a lot before, we at academics were very trustworthy. We we, we trusted something that we we very we're naive. It's a cutthroat world out there, and you really gotta just doubt everything and. We were fortunate in our last in our last acquisition. We went and it was it was trust in both ways, and it was a great exit in terms of a good match. Not necessarily the biggest exit, but a, a good match. And I think at the end of the day, that was more valuable to us. You've got to see what's valuable to you, but you've got to second guess everything. And it is true, you know, business is business, and it's ruthless. If I can add something to this story, so you, you asked earlier, you know, how did your uh, your VC in our case, our VCs were extremely knowledgeable uh, of, of, of uh, you know, 
player when it came to potential acquisition. We talked to PEs and we talked to uh, uh, strategics as well. And uh, they really had a good sense for the reputation of different organizations and games that they were engaging in. And they were really able to provide us with some very uh, useful guidance in terms of interpreting the signals we're getting from the different players. And so that's an example where you clearly, as a you don't have, you know, don't have that sort of experience. There's no way you can tell. There's no, there's no absolute wisdom here. But knowing who the players are, knowing what their history is, that's such, so valuable at that stage of the process. So we had that, we had that input as well, and it was still the games were even more than every other piece. I mean, they knew each other very well. And sometimes even that could only go so much. Yeah. Somebody once said that the only only power you ever have in negotiation is to have alternatives. You must have alternatives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if, I, if I've got enough time for one last question, um, I, I, this is a, a question of some significant uh, interest to me. Um, uh, cybersecurity actually outraised um, robotics, seven million to, or seven billion to five billion in 2017, which is the, the, the last year that I, I found data on, easily anyway. Um, CMU has an unbelievable robotics presence. It has an unbelievable cybersecurity presence. Um, DARPA challenges have been won uh, in both areas uh, by people uh, affiliated with CMU. Um, and yet there are many more robotics uh, startups than there are, uh, and, and you're the head of one of them here with one of them, uh, founder of one of them, uh, Marius. Uh, um, what, 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 are, what is the, um, can, can you give us one thought about what might be most helpful here in Pittsburgh at CMU uh, to help uh, foster the, um, the cybersecurity environment? Or is that too tough a question? Marius. <laughs> to anybody who will take that one. I, I think there are many different elements to this puzzle. Uh, we're comparing apples and oranges. Funding a robotics company and funding a cybersecurity company are very different things, right? Robotics, you've got hardware that's often involved. The investments are considerably greater. Uh, the cycles might be longer as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean, although this is true too, it doesn't necessarily mean that having more money being raised implies you know, more activity actually taking place within, within that space. This being said, I think that uh, you know historically, and, and uh, there, there's been uh, probably also more researchers in robotics, perhaps at Carnegie Mellon, that you've had in cybersecurity per se. Obviously, the SCI has a very significant presence, but the SCI is not focused solely on, on research. There's a significant uh, you know dissemination and education uh, components uh, to, to the SCI also. So that might also be, I think, a, a difference. I think the way things are going. Uh, based on uh, anecdotal interactions I've got with my colleagues at Salab, there's uh, an increasing amount of interest in starting companies. And so I wouldn't be surprised if over time there's some more and more startups coming out of CMU. The researchers that will be involved are clearly the faculty are, are top grade. They've got more of an awareness of what's possible uh, commercially speaking. And so I would expect to see more of that in the future. Great. And now that just a small, I think Pittsburgh is an environment for startups which has changed dramatically the last two years. And I think it's really a very fragile environment. So I think it's right. I think it, it, it is really too late to, you know, get more faculty from cybersecurity to start startups. I think they're able to retain the talent, because that's the main thing, is talent retention. We had this whole discussion about everyone wants to go to the Bay Area. I think that the change in Pittsburgh is becoming more attractive, and I think more folks are willing to stay here. So I think in that sense, there's a brighter future is emerging. Great. Anybody else? Good. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, you all represent the really the, the leading lights here in, in, in cybersecurity in Pittsburgh, and it's uh, been a thrill to, to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We will do Q and A with both groups after. Okay. Welcome to the Schwartz Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, very excited to, to have an event to try to kick off the interest in, in creating cybersecurity startups. As many people have said, the 
the uh, research here is, is at the world class at the top. Uh, but we haven't kept pace with creating startups that are coming out of that world class research. So uh, we're going to drop the O from the founders panel, and we're going to have the funders panel here. And uh, uh, these are the people that provide the fuel for the innovation engine that is the research that gets done here. So we're excited about that. Um, I hope you love our space here. We, uh, we moved in here last fall um, through the generosity of that man on the wall right behind you, James R. Schwartz. Uh, Jim is a Carnegie Mellon alum. Uh, he's a native Pittsburgher, uh, and uh, he is a world-class investor. He was the founder of Axel Partners, which is one of the top venture capital firms uh, in, in the world. Uh, and, you know, Pittsburgh's a small place, and there's always a little story in there. Uh, for All Secure just raised a, a big round. Uh, I don't know how public it is or how much and who was in it, but Jim Schwartz, uh, his firm lost out on the deal, but he got to invest in For All Secure directly as an individual. So it's a, uh, there's a lot of excitement of, about uh, what's, what's happening here. Um, we really do want to leave some time for Q&A, so I think we'll be a little bit shorter. Uh, you know, this is a world-class resource right here. These four people represent a spectrum of different investors, uh, and they all have their <coughs> type of focus and the type of way that they like to, to work with uh, the startup. So uh, we'll ask a few questions to get going, and then I think we'll bring the rest of the panelists back up and do a little bit of Q&A and have a little networking after that, okay? So um, before I get started with that, I do want to uh, thank the, my colleagues that helped put this together, Harold. Uh, Michael, Reed, and Peter, uh, uh, you know, they put a lot of work into to trying to organize an event just to, to sort of get this spark. So thank you all for doing that. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that are going on and a lot of trends that are out there. And, and I'd like uh, each of the panelists to, to comment on this. But I'm going to start with David Dorsey from uh, Osage University Partners. Mm -hmm. uh, should, wait, before I do that, should, should I have them introduce themselves again? It's been, you know, probably 30 minutes plus since you know, <laughs> heard from them and you're meeting a lot of new people. So maybe I ought to do that. Chen? Uh, Chen Sun Wang, I'm the founder and general partner of Rain Capital. We focus on early stage cybersecurity companies, uh, funding them. And you were a faculty member. Too. I was a faculty member, yes. Awesome. See, you can change careers and become an amazing venture capitalist. Oh, pivoting. What? Pivoting. Pivoting, pivoting. pivoting. Yes. pivoting. yes, yes. yes. Uh, and I'm David Dorsey. I'm with Osage University Partners. Um, so we've been around since 2009. We're a fund that invests exclusively in university spinouts. Um, we are relatively agnostic with respect to sector, so we have a life science investment team that does therapeutics and medical devices. Um, and then we have a tech investment team, um, which is mostly people with you know engineering, computer science background, but I'm a member of the tech investment team. So we just um, closed our third fund. This is a <coughs> $273 million fund, um, and we've invested in 90 university spinouts. So we look at a lot of different kinds of deals uh, from um, 90 university partners in North America, Israel, and Singapore. Uh, hi, I'm John Funge. Um, I am floored by this space. I, so I, I went to undergrad here at EE a long time ago, and I am very envious of this whole setup. Um, so uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I found and built and sold three companies, and I kind of went to the other side of the table just about a year ago. So in the, in the grand scheme of funders, I'm relatively a newbie, but I've been on the other side of the, as an entrepreneur a few times raising money. Um, I work at Data Tribe, and so Data Tribe is a seed fund, and that's usually their, some of the earliest money. We like to be first kind of institutional money in. We'll write checks up to $2 million. And we were started by a very experienced Bay Area cybersecurity investor. He's got Bob Ackerman. He's had a Sand Hill Road fund for like 25 years doing nothing but cyber. And he long wanted to have a seed fund on the East Coast close to NSA. And so we are a stone's throw from NSA, a stone's throw from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And we are set up as a startup studio. Uh, and so we are optimized in that we have experienced founders like myself on the team that work really closely with very tech-heavy founders to create truly tier one um, startups, and that's what we do. Zach Malone, I'm with Draper Triangle Ventures. We were founded in 1999 by actually another guy on the wall somewhere, I'm sure he's back there. John Jones. Um, we invest in the Midwest of the United States, uh, typically Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan, really the areas that are underserved by most large coastal venture firms. And we like to, at least we tell ourselves, we've gotten kind of good at helping companies scale out the Midwest and 
address concerns they have very early on until they need to raise you know, larger rounds of funding or to acquire them. Um, we're sector agnostic. We do a lot of software, less robotics and medical devices that we still focus on. Um, cybersecurity software certainly falls under that kind of broad uh, umbrella. And that's it. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, and again, as you can tell, it's a, it's a wide array of different approaches and focuses. And it's very important as an entrepreneur to understand who your investors are to not waste their time and therefore not waste your time because you have to have that fit in mind. Um, obviously, I think the, the, the group here is going to want to hear about the different trends that we're seeing uh, in, in cybersecurity in general. So this will be a question that's open to the whole panel, but I want to start with David. David, you focus on universities. Uh, what kinds of trends in terms of research becoming companies are you seeing in universities? Yeah, I think just to uh, go back to, you know, um, the kinds of companies that we see, we see them at various stages. So very often I will be encountering PIs when they're just starting to develop the technology, and then sometimes I'll encounter them later on when they've brought in um, a serial entrepreneur as a CEO. But many of them are like what Alex was describing, where they're publishing, they're doing research, they have a really neat technology, and they're getting inbound. Like there's some evidence of, of product market fit. And so there are some trends that have changed a lot over the years. I would say recently I've seen a lot of stuff addressing I don't know what you'd call it, like zero trust architectures, AppSec, since the Equifax, Equifax breach. So, um, you know, a lot of thinking in the universities about maybe how to redesign the architecture and the way applications touch data. Um, there's been some other, um, uh, I'd say, trends that have come up, um, and this has largely been because I think CISOs are pushing for it. The value proposition isn't just to minimize risk, it's also to help with compliance. And compliance becoming more and more difficult. We've seen coming out of universities, you know, um, more attack simulators that'll help uh, uh, to discover, you know, and, and quantify the risk in your company. Um, uh, companies that allow you to, you know, uh, make uh, easy reporting and, 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 you know, fulfill your compliance obligations. These are a big deal. And um, of course, you know, as Wombat knows, like training is a, is a big and growing uh, market as well. Um, and so we see a lot of that stuff. Um, one of the other things I see, I think that is kind of unique to the university that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about the sort of startups that we see, is we're seeing more and more open source startups. Um, you know, we invest in a company called Corelake, which started out as Bro, if anybody knows what it is. It's like, it was basically an open source software that was used for network monitoring and kind of parses uh, network packets. It was started by Vern Paxson, and you know, people use it for years and years, and um, enterprises want to deploy, and they just, you know, they don't have people on hand that know how to do it, so they just put, Row in a box, call it core light, and you know these are the kinds of things. But but you know the the um, uh, the story with that is this is what's the nice thing about a university startup uh, using open source is that they can see how people use the open source and they can look to see like what are the use cases and they can identify product market fit so that when you go to a to a VC you don't have to have 16 customers you can just say we have you know 100 users and they're all using it in this space and there's a market associated with that so. There's some unique go-to-market paths I see coming out of, out of universities and, um, in, in these areas. Shinji, you want to uh, focus fund? Right. What do you see? Um, so as a sector-focused fund, as Anne was saying earlier, that we are a sector-focused uh, investment firm. So we uh, dig very deep on security technology and security markets. Um, and my background um, as a, a technologist in training has always been in computer security. So um, at this point, if I get a pitch on computer security technology, I have visceral reactions to what I think the technology will do or not do for the market. And my reaction is not always 100% correct, so I always bring in a network of people to help me evaluate as well. But directionally, I usually can tell whether this addresses a compelling problem or this is a, a nice to have. So the first filter is, is this, are you selling penicillin or are you selling vitamin? Right, that's the first filter. And if I think it's penicillin, then I'm gonna push you forward into the due diligence uh, channel. So uh, one of the things we do is I can connect uh, startups directly with the people who will buy this technology. So recently I got a pitch on application security and those technologies typically are used by product security teams right, within companies. So the first five people I brought in to evaluate this technology is the head of product security at Oracle, head of product security
security at Tesla, head of product security at um, uh, Cognizant, and, and two others all head of product security. So those guys all put their customer hat on. They say, hey, if I were uh, given this pitch as a uh, potential customer, uh, what features I like, does this address my problem? And then they give me feedback right away and, and really help me understand not only my own uh, perspective, but cu customers, how they evaluate a technology. And very quickly, we come to a conclusion of how much of product market fit this is, right? So, so one of the big trends we see today is cloud security, is how do you help customers migrate workloads from uh, on-premises on data centers to the cloud, uh, but there are a ton of mundane stuff you have to do there. It's not always shiny technology. It's about how to automatically understand the policies and automatically apply configuration, which uh, in the academic land could be very boring thing to do, but it's absolutely what companies need. Right? And, and so a, a startup can address that kind of need. I'm actually talking to two startups right now whose sole focus is how do I automatically help people move workload to the cloud and automatically secure it and, and verify it's secure. And I, I just love that kind of um, startup. Yeah, very interesting. So obviously there are, there are ways to innovate through technology, yes. um, but there, there are other ways to innovate. And Zach, we were talking a little bit earlier about some of the ways that you see companies in, innovate other than just the technology. Yes, so in, in the earlier panel, I hit on this a lot, uh, Yeah, the two, two kind of trends we see if, and the companies really become the most successful in this space tend to be ones that innovate not only in the technology and the capabilities to kind of that high level vision of the ROI that you bring to the table, but also kind of that early uh, customer adoption strategy and how you can get a few things wrong quickly and build a solution. Uh, you know, Wombat did this very well and that helped them grow and expand very quickly in a you know, capital efficient manner. Just one other example, we have a company that offers a free product to help secure enterprise collaboration tools. And the, it's a little sketchy, so uh, bear with me. But the, they then take that data and bring it into the CISOs or the C-suite and say, hey, just so you know, and this is not what the original application is for, but there's you know, X amount of sexual harassment going on. There's credit cards on your collaboration platform. And it's kind of a creative way to help, you know, you should buy our full paid product or else it's gonna get out there. Um, so other strategies like that can really help you grow. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's just something for me to see, it, to really differentiate between a good company and a great company. Yeah, John, um, your model at Data Tribe is a little bit different. Obviously you're seeing trends, you're, you know, Bob, one of the folks at the NSA. Um, what is a studio model and how does that sort of differentiate from an accelerator or from a pure VC firm? And, and, and does that make it so that you see different yeah, um, so I, I don't know if we see different things. We are very focused. So we do about 80% of our investing is, is cybersecurity. Um, and we have this, um, we call it our frame trust. So it sounds a little bit like um, uh, some of your, your organization as well. We get you know, head of Google, cloud security, head of Cisco's uh, security, and all, uh, you know, CTO and so forth. Folks like this are investors in our fund and they're, they're, we're able to reach out to them when we have questions because we don't certainly don't know everything. Um, as a studio, uh, so we are, we're right the shot. We, we will, our plan is to do four investments this year and we'll, we'll see many hundred that kind of come through. Uh, so it's, it's a very, as opposed to more of an accelerator model where, we, where there might be a cohort that goes through and there's a relatively small amount of capital put into each of those. Where the strategy there is put a little bit of capital in and kind of follow on on the ones that seem to be taking off. I actually see data type uh, companies coming out of data type and they come to places like us. They do? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're um, we're very rifle shot. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna go all in. So in you know sort of in for a penny, in for a pound, and we will uh, usually go in for two million at seed. We try to give the the company about eighteen months of runway. And our typical model is that we will take a board seat, and then we'll have one of our kind of operating partners, experienced team members, essentially in bed with the company as a co-founder. Um, our preference, though not exclusively, is to have the companies uh, come and and essentially work out of our, we have a facility kind of like this um, down in, in Maryland that can um, host six companies and we, our preference is to have them there 
basically until they get to that next round of funding. And we have, um, it's, it's certainly not um, a formula because it's very different depending on the strengths and weaknesses of any one team, but we have a kind of playbook where roughly speaking over the course of around 12 to 18 months, we're gonna really very, you know, sort of intensely focus on getting the, the product market fit right, getting a really good product roadmap, applying product management principles, because a lot of times folks, or really technical folks don't even know what product management is. It's like what is, pro you know, sort of like understanding how to prioritize things and, and really listening and talking to customers, so on and so forth. Then it's bringing in that head of kind of sales and, and really figuring out pricing and go to market strategy and marketing. And then really it's sort of like really kind of teasing and preceding that next round of funding. And so this is kind of stage, these stages we go through um, and it really helps to kind of de-risk and really helps to accelerate. And, and again, there's this, this scrum of support around somebody <coughs> at the center who has a brilliant idea, who is a brilliant technologist. And that, that's kind of the idea. Okay, I appreciate that, thanks. And now I'm gonna ask one more question. I'm gonna uh, direct it to Shenzi, but anybody else can sort of add that in because we do wanna to get to some active Q&A. Uh, and, and you know, you talked about the, the medicine versus vitamin model, yeah. and I, I love that analogy. It's, it's a great one, although, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, you're evaluating a lot of these companies and you're seeing some of the best practices in taking sort of university research and people at the earliest, early stage of the, the, the startup world go from a technology to a product yeah. to a real growing company. And what, what do you see are the best practices and then anybody else can switch on? Um, so, I think this, as a technologist, from personal experience, I didn't know in the past there was a difference between technology and product in the past. Now I know, and there's a huge gap actually between a usable technology to a, a product people will actually pay money for. And there's um, this great communication of the ACM articles, it's um, you know, here in academia, um, was written by the co-founders of a, a software security company called Coverity came out of Stanford, it was uh, Dawson Engler's company and, and his three students. And they took many, many years, but they, they did, uh, they sold the company to Synopsys, right? Um, so this company was brilliant technologist. They had a code analysis uh, algorithm and they built this technology and you give them a piece of code that they could analyze and tell you whether they are potential vulnerabilities, right? So what's great about this article, I mean, I, I read several times, I just love it. So the first a few customers, they had this technology, they go to the customer and they say, hey, we have this great thing to help you scan code and, and uh, you know, all these great features. And the customers said, great, how do I start your product? How do I start using it? And they say, oh, you install this software and you type this on command line. And the, and the customer said, what's a command line? <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> the, <laughs> the, the gap of what customers expect and what they deliver were very different things. It took them a uh, really good part of two years to figure out what is the format of the thing that you deliver to the customer that people will actually understand how to use it, understand the value, and say, yes, this is something we want to interact with every day, and we'll tell our other peers in the industry that this is a good thing to have, versus just something they experiment in the lab. Um, and so there's a lot of the productization mindset has to go in, into in the early stage to say, okay, this is, the technology has input and output, okay, but what would the customer want to see as input and output, regardless what the, the back-end technology is? And that set of questions, I think, are really critical to ask in the beginning. And to be honest, I've seen a ton of not so great technology, but have great product packaging is actually doing fantastic in the marketplace because it addresses need, people see what they wanted to see and is exactly what they had budget for. So if you have a great technology but don't have the great packaging, you're not doing yourself a service. David, I think a lot of your target companies or startups are, are represented by people in the audience here. Uh, can you expand upon that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so I just had a meeting yesterday with a company that I think is doing something amazing. Um, it's not a company yet, actually. It's a, it's a professor who's got a really neat technology. And so we, the question that came from the partners was, so so describe the product. And and 
he went on to describe the technology, right? The, exactly. the solution. And, exactly. and then so he said, no, 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 we mean like the product, like how do you pitch it to a customer? So he gave like an abridged version. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I mean, we definitely see this all of, we definitely see this all the time. And, and um, I would say, you know, uh, Norman also alluded to this, uh, capital efficiency is something that we look for. We look, we look for people who um, um, are cognizant of the fact that you're probably gonna, it's gonna be a long haul and you want optionality. You're gonna have to pivot. It's not gonna look like what it looks like now. Um, but I think the most important thing for us is, um, you know, and, and this is coming from someone who only invests in university startups. We don't think that everybody is fit to be a CEO. And most of the time, the scientific founder is not is the CEO. Rare instances, they actually do become CEO. But they may have to get the first five customers. They still have to get the first, and they're also going to have to recruit. And so even if there's not a CEO in place, this scientific founder has to be a compelling person. And I know that's not like best practices, but what do you do? They have to have, they have to be someone that people want to work for. They want to take equity and no cash for. They want to stay up late and do things for them because they trust them. And um, so although we're looking at technologies, and you know, as, as, as that's our ideal universe, we're almost always investing in people. And the earlier stage it is almost, you know, the, the more important the, the person is. It's, it's just, it's, it's, you know, we're just, um, we're looking for people who um, have like a sort of infectious personality. And then, like, and I had the same similar background. I came from Lockheed Martin, you know, I have a PhD in double and years and years of being an engineer. When I first was applying for the job, they let me sit in on some pitches, and then they would ask me to give my, my point of view. And one of them, I was openly hostile to them because they said, you know, they were doing something with like edge uh, computing, and they were doing in-memory, in-flash memory uh, computing of deep neural networks, and they kept saying that it's AI at the edge, and I was like, no, because you're not training, you're just doing matrix multiplication on flash, that's not even interesting. Like, this company raised a lot of money, okay? so like. Um, afterwards, the partner came to me and said, so what did you think of him? I said, I don't know, he's okay. But I think the technology is stupid. He's like, you have like 30% of what it takes to be an investor. And so I would say, like, knowing what I know now, like I would say it's probably less. Like nobody cares what my technical expertise is. You know, for the most part, um, you know, you kind of connect them with CISOs and customers and find out if there's like a connection there or not. You know, I don't trust myself to know these things. But, but I think we're getting better identifying people who um, can raise money and hire people. They're sales, yeah. they're sales people. And, and, and they, they have to be able to close the first a few handful customers. That's their if job. If the CEO cannot sell a single, <laughs> sell to a single account, not a good CEO to have. But and we've seen fact, professors get the first five customers. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 yeah. so they are, the professors could be a good yeah. CEO. Yeah. Um, but in fact, you know, if any of you are thinking about founding companies, I would say, Maybe you'll be CEO for a little bit, but get out of that seat as soon as possible. You don't even want that job. Yeah, you, you don't to, want that job. You have job. to have lunch you with us not. I have this discussion yeah. with, with professors all the time. The most important title is not CEO, it's founder. Yeah. And yeah. no one can ever take, take that, that away from, from you. Right. A CEO may be, may be glamorous, you go talk to customers, you go talk to the media, but 30, 40% of your job is like, oh, this guy gets upset, this team gets upset, trying to get them together. It's non-glamorous operating work. You talk to VCs all day. You don't want to do that. <laughs> John, are that kind of bad for that? So are, in terms of whether you want to be a CEO or whether you, in terms of packaging? Well, uh, yes, it was around the, the, the best practices that the, audi the, the, the potential entrepreneurs in the audience can use to get to the next step. And I think David and Shenji gave some really great advice. Yeah. Is there anything else? No, I mean, that? I think what one of the themes that we're hearing here, and it's really true, is that the, the actual nut of the idea or kind of thing is, is very, very important, but it's a relatively small percentage. I mean, that, that kind of getting out into the market and creating, you know, essentially figuring out how to message it in a concise way that an average human, you gotta think of a, a chief information security officer, you know, they have hundreds and hundreds of companies to keep track of, it's mind boggling. And um, so it's incredibly important just messaging and being able to succinctly uh, communicate the value of what you're doing um, and then making sure that you have related proof points and product that, that backs it up. And all of that is, is stuff that's kind of soft. It's not particularly hard kind of technical work, but super, super, super important. Yeah. Right. And it's what Peter said earlier. It's the 10X or it's the compelling value or the compelling, the cheaper offer. That's what resonates. That's what's important. Zach, any last comment? I think those are all really good examples. Uh, and I don't know if this is the best practice, but just one more to add that 
It seems like the longer you wait to raise venture capital, the better you can figure out if your business model is going to be a good fit for venture capital or not. And decide, you, you don't want to start that, that fuse too early. So getting as far as you can on your own dime is usually a good move. Um, and you know, not raising venture capital a lot of times is the best option. So <laughs> if you can go that route. Yeah. Best funding is customers pay. Right. Yeah. Right. But I will say one more thing, because this was mentioned about non-dilutive capital coming from SPIRs and DARPA proposals and stuff like that. Like the the amount of paperwork you have to do to, to fulfill like a DARPA BAA if you're subcontracting yeah. to yeah. a larger company or something like that, like it's a lot of money. But if it takes you really far off your roadmap, you should yeah. just it dilutes your But I, I yeah. do have yeah. one yeah. more we'll thing. Pay for it in the end. I do have one more thing to say to uh, Zach's comment about waiting as long as you can to raise venture capital. There is a downside to that. When you raise money, when you take take somebody else's money, you're responsible for on your own dime. That pressure is different. So you can take longer to get there. So what that for certain founders, very disciplined, you can still run the company the same rate. But others, this may turn into a lifestyle business. And you don't want to run a lifestyle um, business. So it's it's not always a bad thing to raise capital early on because you now have somebody else to answer for. So hence you have pressure to execute. Thank you. Uh, can we ask the, the first panel to come back up and uh, open the, the, this up to Q&A? Uh, Reed is going to moderate uh, the Q&A for us. You guys can stay seated. I'll, I'll grab a couple more chairs. for someone and trying to train their bullshit detector, what would it be? Anyone well, wants to answer that? I, uh, I, look, looking at their website or talking to someone and having them throw, you know, every buzzword, you know, someone who says they do AI and they just go through the whole list, I'm kind of like, okay, yeah. we're done. Yeah, like, if I can't understand it, if it's not English, you know, and you, <laughs> you can really tell if someone's just adding words, you know, because they think it'll help. So I mean, for me, that's the most obvious thing. I mean, sometimes I go to websites, I'm like, I think I sort of smart. I have no idea what they do. So, yeah, you know. I, I, so it, 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 asking just a few kind of like questions below the surface in terms of how things actually work. And if they, if they start to kind of go off the rails in terms of the explanation, you can kind of quickly suss out that, that it's just kind of made up. Well, they'll or, tell you this yeah. is secret sauce. We can't tell you. <laughs> I can tell you how many times oh, this is secret sauce. And I used to be a, um, a analyst too at, at Forrester, so I used to take hundreds, thousands of briefings, and same thing, right? So some vendors will come and tell you, uh, "Oh, we're doing everything under the sun." And you're like, uh, "Do you do this? How do you do this?" And then they're like, "That's secret sauce." And you're like, "Okay." <laughs> In the back channel, the, uh, if it's multi-analyst briefing, we always say, "This guy is bullshitting, bullshit artist." Yeah. So that happens a lot. So if we could drill down into that a little bit, what's your suggestion for people? How do they talk about their technology if they're nervous about being picked? So my sense uh, is if your technology is truly good, uh, nobody can take that away from you because you're the one who understands that the most, right? And if you can confidently tell people you still have, after that, you still have the best product, then you are winning. But if you're afraid of telling people just a little bit and they'll take it away, you're not a winner to begin with. I would say this goes back to a little bit what we were talking about. 
before, like if you're pitching the technology first, it's already backwards. Like start by talking about the product. I'll ask technical questions, right? And actually, um, I, I would say start talking about what problem you solve. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, what's the customer value proposition? And then another thing I would say is customers really don't care if it's AI or not. Like you know, they, like they don't, observable they don't. networks detects you know, stuff at the endpoints, or it doesn't. Like who cares if they're using deep learning or not? Like the customer doesn't care. Um, and so it's not even, it shows some naivete to think that they think that that's a value prop. It's not, right? So my answer is, it's sort of I want to bring it back to investors. I, I, my default would be, you know, IT portfolio, show me what you patented, show me what's involved. Of. Even if original patent, at least you've got things out there you're thinking, you should be able to talk about those things. That's what I would say, that's what's my default. But I want to hear your thoughts to that. Oh yeah, I, I was probably like saying that's the last thing. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. 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 I, 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 that is like that. that is like after we've already made right. a decision to right. invest, then we'll look and it might make us not invest. So it would never make us invest. Yeah. So I have taken pitches from companies have ton of provisional patents, and if or even full patents, what or, or even full patents. Mm -hmm. But if you dig into deeper, some of them are bullshit patents or uh, people who have a ton of patents may not necessarily indicate that they could build a product, right? So I think it's a it's a nice to have, it's an add-on, but it's not a deciding factor. And well, the startups aren't going to sue anybody. Yeah, well, yeah. And, well, the other thing is, the speed at which a lot of these industries kind of form, like companies form, is, is that sort of like a totally different gear than the PTO, and so like, go, a better go-to-market and a more adoptable product is probably in some ways going to win the win the day over yeah. some really strong IP portfolio in this type of business. Now, if I was building a pharmaceutical or some kind of hardware or something, I might have a different point of view, but at least in this type of thing, that's at least our mindset. Yeah, I think, for just to add on that for a second, I think for investors, we're not necessarily looking to set off our own bullshit detectors. We're looking, will this set off the customer's bullshit detector, right? And if the, the answer is no, and because they may care about the IP in the West, as long as the technology works, then that's... But I mean, if you're selling it right, I mean, if, if it sounds plausible and you've got the facts for the IP to back it up, is that aligning a good story? I mean, your your credibility. Like, this is something I I I, I sorry. It was, it was like a total surprise to me when I became an investor. Like, I was shocked at how much investors take your word, right? Like, they're going to get to the truth eventually, but in first meetings, they're going to assume like you have credibility. You're a professor. You have credentials, and that like what you say you can do, you can do. And then the question is, do customers want what you say you can do? Um, and so I think like if somebody starts making me feel like uneasy, then I might start scratching the surface and start getting down into the details. And that's where we might end up looking at IP. But but I, I yeah. More, more so so uh, as far as the question is concerned, I would say look for who the customers are. Right? If the company doesn't have customers, it's probably a bad sign. Ultimately, the proof well, is in the pudding. But regarding the IP, so we were a cybersecurity company and we're involved in patent litigation. So we're not completely. This tends to come in a bit later. So certainly at an early stage when you talk to company, and there are unique companies with unique technology, and you want that technology to be protected from day one. There are many cybersecurity companies where the patent initially is just not going to be there. It's maybe impossible to come up with the ultimate patent. There are just so many different ways of doing the same thing. It really depends on the fact of the technology and the fact of the company that, that we're looking at. But I would not completely discount the fact that IP protection is important. I mean, we, uh, you know, we found that ourselves, uh, there, are, there were just so many different ways of coming up with variations of our product. We protected us, ourselves as best as we could. There were people who competed with us with variations, and you wouldn't believe the tiny little things that it would change and be able to get away with. And, and, and so it's a tough game, but ultimately, if you've got a fast bunch of patents and they've got a bunch of patents, you can actually you know, uh, deal with these situations where they come after you, you can threaten to come after them. If you've got nothing, then you're very exposed. Mm -hmm. Founders, I'm curious, when you invest in an organization or company, what are the three or five main points that you always look to say, yes, I want to invest in that organization? What do you look for? Um, organization or, or technology? Any, any investment that you make, what, what's um, the three or five top Yes, yeah, so I talked about this earlier at the I&I &I, uh, uh, event. So, uh, I have three general things. Um, I'm simplifying. That. The first is uh, like the 
first question I ask is, are you selling vitamin or are you selling penicillin? So that's first one. If you, if you pass that filter, the second filter is, do I see a clear or at least a, a semblance of a, a clear way of go to market? Right? Can I take you to uh, my network and, and they will see the value? Or is this something I can take to Accenture and they will implement it? In a, where, where's the go to market channel? And the third one is, do I believe in the team? And is this a team that can execute? Uh, and if the question to all of these three, um, uh, answers to all these three questions are yes, then you're more, most likely going to get follow on meetings and you're going to get my experts to come in and talk to you. And I actually have uh, some of my portfolio companies talk to the experts that I've I brought in and they, they struck a million dollar deal in the valuation. And that is the type of company that I love working with. Yeah, I would say, like, I mean, I said before, I think probably 60% of our investment decisions are team. And that means they have a good listener, they have a good mindset, they're able to hire and recruit the best talent around them. Um, also, we are looking at the size of the market and product market fit. Um, you know, of course, like you can have a great team, but if they're you know running into a bad market, there's nothing that a great team can do. And then the third one, I think, is probably you know the technology, the differentiation, because um, the best technology just doesn't go to market all the time. You just weren't guaranteed to that. So um, again, it goes back to team. I mean, even the things like like if I was worried about IP, again, I would assume this is a team that would actually handle that. Like later on, when it becomes an issue, they'll take care of that. It's you know we're, it's it's the it's probably one and two uh, top things. I would add that there's certainly no, I mean, there's there's a lot of common things, but there's not, it's very important as a founder to understand the business of venture capital. I mean, and what, and we, we are at the end of the day trying to get sort of return, and if you guys don't know what an IRR is, just look it up on Wikipedia, because that at this, is at the center of the model, and, and at the center of an IRR is time, like sort of cash on cash return, how fast it is. So, you know, certainly time and, and how fast we think we can get into the market, but. We look at massive, we, we sort of play, I, I kind of call it, this is my own kind of, the, the sort of Bay Area offense, and, and at least where we are. And we're not the same as all other organizations, other people do different things, but um, meaning that we swing for home runs. We're not going for like doubles, triples. Every, every time we're trying to swing for a home run, and so it means like huge problems, huge markets. Now we, have, we pay really close attention because cyber is so noisy, and like you guys were out at RSA, there's a bajillion, you know, like it's just, there's a bajillion companies we really try to pay attention to opportunities where, where it's like whatever they're doing is really kind of like novel and new and like rises above the noise. But that introduces a bit of a timing question because you, you can go too far out over the horizon and get like ahead of your skis. And, and so it's like really carefully gauging the ultimate size of this market relative to is it really like, a, does it rise above the noise, but is it not too far in the future? Exactly. Yeah. For us, it's again, team. Like teams one, two, and three, and then some eloquent way to kind of repackage everything else that, <laughs> that was mentioned by the other investors. But yeah, the, the founding team is the biggest, biggest piece. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, so uh, there's been something of a pushback against uh, venture capital funds that certainly social impact funds, right? So they look for um, what your technology brings to the society, to the human factor. And those funds don't necessarily, um, uh, they also care about IRR, but the way they care about IRR is different, uh, not the same as traditional VC firm. And I would say that um, if the, the pressure for return is not something that you're striving for as a startup, and don't get funding from a traditional VC firm. Right, right that was the question. Like, what does that landscape look like? So, what, so uh, what's the alternative? Have you ever seen a social impact fund pick up? Something? So, I would just love to make a point yeah. that I, I kind of believe that, I mean, this is just the lion's share of cyber it does have a higher positive mission compared to a lot of other things in tech. Like, well, B2B. Well, 
Yeah. But it, but it's it's like we we in a lot of ways, you know, our enterprises are being attacked by nation states from other countries, and so helping major banks defend themselves. I mean, you're doing a really positive social good. So I would just overall, with regard to cyber in general, whether it's being funded through kind of traditional VC or some other model, I, I just think the whole sector is very mission oriented. We see this all the time when we have folks that come into, you know, either from military or for the intelligence community come into our companies. They're still extremely mission driven in, in what they're doing. As for the, the kind of move fast, and I think there's, you have to kind of drill into that and, and look at the context in which that swings out. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong in, in kind of quickly figuring out what's working and what's not working. But if you're creating a lot of negative externalities in society doing that, then there's problems. But I think you have to look at it on a case by case basis. Uh, so I think, sorry, go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I think there were a couple of examples of, um, especially in the B2B space, just because you take venture money, they're not all like, go, go, go. And, Here's we're going to give you to 30 million and go blow it up. That's that's not the dynamic here. I mean, you want to get your seed money, and it's a small, you know, a million dollars, five, it, and and that's a time to really figure out your product market fit. So, you know, go fast and break things. I think it's a little more of the B2C model, at least from my perspective. I mean, I've been in the world for a long time, taking a lot of venture money, and I don't find them just wanting us to, yeah. you know go faster, go faster without kind of thoughtful constraints and, and gates along the way. So I just say rather than a broad bush, you know, venture is this way, I would say, you know, there's one, there's different kind of venture firms that you see here, but there's also, you can go slower and end up with a greater return. And I think we have a great example of that. Yeah. I, I, I'm just gonna say, like, I, that's the, the, for me the um, move fast and break, like nobody's moving fast and breaking anything in healthcare. <laughs> You know, what I mean, like, like right. no one's selling to hospitals. Break, like, if you're if you're looking for funds that are probably um, where the products are probably more virtuous, right? Look at their portfolio. Like, you just look on their website and see who they've invested in. Come, you know, VCs who, who tend to be all B two B tend to be, I think, um, um, investing in products that are much more on the virtuous side. They're addressing large markets, which is like healthcare, you know, fintech, you know, finance, things like that. Like, these are not these are not social. Networks. specifically focused on creating impact. I can give you an example. Example of Omnidir Ventures, it's kind of hard to pronounce. Um, they have a fund, especially in social impact. So they are funding things like privacy related um, technology, bring them to market. And they will spend money helping you to get these, distribute these technologies in the hands of consumers while otherwise consumer uh, customer acquisition will be very high cost, and they'll help help you because they're social impact fund. And for traditional VC fund, it's a little bit harder to uh, to execute in that way. Yeah. Right, do you want to talk a little bit about some of your funding? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and not just funding. I think there are many different facets to the question that you're asking. But VCs are a central part of the way our, our economy works, and they really enable you to take risks that uh, you know other mechanisms for funding uh, would not necessarily be willing. And when you start a company, there are many different ways in which you can have a positive impact. You can make a positive impact to your product. Obviously, it depends on what you're selling. Even in cybersecurity, there are a variety of different products. You may feel less comfortable about offensive products versus defensive uh, products. That's a personal uh, type of, uh, of decision. Uh, but uh, as, you, as you start a company, as we did, for instance, with Wombat, you're creating jobs. You're contributing to the local economy. Uh, you can uh, you know, even fund a variety of different activities in the community. There are all sorts of things of that nature that you can do. One thing I'd like to, to, to get to uh, is when we, when we were getting to start a company, not everyone in our research group felt comfortable with the idea of starting a company. Some of them felt that we had to give away all the technology. And I was not on that side, <coughs> as you can probably guess. Uh, and uh, the case I made to some of our PhD students who felt like we received this money from the government, we owe it to not make a penny out of it. We should just, you know, make it available to everyone who wants to use it. And we had a lot of people who wanted to use it. And uh, I basically asked them to think about what it would take to maintain that technology and to really have the sort of impact that they wanted to have. We had a website at some point where uh, one of our games was made available and it was played by several hundred thousand people for free, right? And, and so to some of the, the people in our group, this was success. This was amazing. They were bragging about it for good reasons. 
I told them that, look, we can have a much, much more significant impact if we go commercial route, because we'll generate you know, so much more revenue. We'll be able to further develop this technology. We'll be able to create a whole market around this. We'll be able to protect many more people. Uh, and so at the end of the day, this was clearly the right decision. I've actually followed up with them 10 years later about you know, reminding them about the conversation that we had, and they remember. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad that you did. And they made some money in the pro process, too, as, as you can imagine. Uh, but it's, there's also a, a personal element to making these decisions about what you want to do with your life, where you want to invest your efforts. And, and it's not one size fits all. Different people will make different decisions. So just one just real quick point on this. I mean, it, we're, this whole panel, both of them are very heavily oriented around product-oriented, kind of venture-backed companies that demand a lot of capital up front. I mean, that, that's one approach to entrepreneurship. I mean, the beautiful thing about entrepreneurship is that there's as many flavors of it as there are people in this room. And you can start companies that don't demand that you raise money. You know, you don't have to, you know, you, they're, they're more cash generative. And, and uh, so there's all kinds of ways of going about it. But what we're talking about today is, is kind of venture backed, product oriented companies. Inside. So, yeah, um, so I, I do agree that there might be more for the project that might take too much um, R&D only probability because they have an expectation of return within like 10 years, for instance. Uh, but to give you a concrete uh, answer, I think it might be started a VC firm that is specializing in those kind of long shot projects that might take a while and a lot of research uh, and financing those. Yeah, the engine, and then they also have a, a, a VUV uh, breakthrough energy ventures is also one that's actually on the case of all Yeah, there are quite a few. I can't think of them all off the top of my head. Yeah. More questions? Absolutely. So uh, in, in the early days, uh, one of the things you, you, you learn uh, is that uh, everybody's willing to talk to you. Uh, the VCs have analysts, and, and their full-time job is to just talk to everybody who's willing to pick up the phone. And it's not that they're going to invest uh, in, in the company the next, the next day. Everybody has their criteria. And you know, once you reach these criteria, then all of a sudden, pocket, pocketbooks op op open up right away. But it, you, you're going to find a lot of people who are just going to be talking to you. And so uh, in 2008, when we started, especially after uh, October, November of 2008, the number of options available to us were actually quite limited. Uh, and so we're lucky enough to uh, be able to rely on a few angels. We, we secured some initial customers uh, just based on the seed money we got from uh, ID Foundry, Innovation Works, uh, and uh, obviously the paying customers that we had. And then uh, within a couple of years, we're able to raise from uh, local uh, angels, uh, private individuals, as well as organizations. So here uh, you've got uh, players again like Series A took place much later. It was actually in 2013. So actually, five years into this, uh, we had a, a very, uh, you know, very well uh, proven uh, business model, recurring revenue, and all sorts of other things. And so we're able to wait until I think it was October of 2013 when we closed our, our Series A round. It was actually a very small round. And then by July of 2014, we raised our Series B round, which was our big round, which today is uh, probably a bit of a joke. We raised like six point something. Where that, that seed money went a long way, uh, and uh, we're able to find people who are more than willing to invest in us uh, and uh, to work under fairly reasonable uh, terms. And uh, Ed Angler was joined our board as we raised our, our uh, Series A, which was very much still actually angel. So we saw our Series A. Uh, nobody was in the lead on our Series A, but it's uh, our Series B. We worked with Level, which is a traditional VC company based out of New York. But the Series A, we wrote the terms. Sorry, but we've reached the amount of money we wanted to raise, and we don't have any room here. We take one more question. Um, if not, let's thank our panel, and then we're going to have Kit and Dave come up. We're going to tell you about some of the resources here to help you with the Avalanche Payment Application.
Invention disclosures made through the university, the university patented them, and then the companies formed by licensing the technology. So in the tech transfer office, we help to manage your intellectual property throughout the, the life cycle of the intellectual property, working with you as an inventor, working with licensees when they license it. But we also get involved in helping um, form strategy around startup companies and helping you connect with internal and external resources. Within our office, we have a, a gap funding program where we can put $25,000 or so into projects to help them hit technical milestones or do market research or, in some cases, hire an entrepreneur as an entrepreneur to work with you. And in that regard, when we talked earlier about the, the challenge of a scientist uh, leading a company, one of the things that we do is, in essence, run a dating service for entrepreneurs who are like looking for the ne next opportunity. So they come through, say, this is my background, this is what I'm looking for, what do you have that might match up? We run down through the list of things that we're aware of and make introductions. So the more we know about what you're doing, the better we are able to make connections for you. And we do a similar sort of thing with investors. So a number of the investors that were up here, we've talked with them through our list of portfolio. Here's the things that are coming up. Here's things that you might want to invest in. So again, the more we know about what you're doing, the more we can be a resource for you and help you connect. And one of the things that we help connect you with is a wide variety of resources that are inside the university, which we're going to hear a little bit more about, but also in the local community and in the broader community. So several of us, Kim and I, are involved with Blue Tree Allied Angels, involved with the Cities Investment Fund, involved with um, the AI robotics investment thing that's coming up with Innovation Works, um, just on and on. There's a bunch of different things going on. Um, so get tapped in, let us know what you're working on, and we can help you look at it. So uh, as you were hearing that sometimes this is, um, you want to go a little slowly, you don't know if this is really a good fit for you or whether you have a good, uh, you have great technology, that's the good thing about working here, it's always it's awesome, but it might not necessarily be a good product or a good business. So I have what I call the toe dip. Um, this is uh, where we can meet one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we have, I have office hours with uh, somebody else from Tech Transfer every Wednesday over in Gates. And you can just walk in and just tell what it is that you do. And then we can be, just begin to have that first conversation to see, well, maybe there is a fit. Secondly, then, and just to say, okay, well, it looks like this has some promise. We have two programs. One is called uh, the NSF i Psych Program. And this is a semester long, it's an equivalent of uh, 10, 10 nights, 10 meetings from five to seven, where you'll meet with will be part of a cohort of 15 startups that are all exploring the potential for their companies. Uh, you will do customer discovery, go out and talk to individuals to find again if there's product market fit, if there's a big problem where the current solutions are not working well. And at the end of that, you'll kind of say, okay, this has got promising, we want to go on to the next step. Or uh, after that, there's no obligation. You just learn some important, valuable skills that can inform your research even, uh, as well as help you found the company. Then we have a third program, it's called the Innovation Fellows. And this one is a little bit more intense. Uh, it is a year long, it starts in September and it concludes in June, where we meet every other week doing 12 to 1.30, where we, this one is competitive to get in, uh, where there is, usually it's the, the postdoc or a PhD candidate who is willing to be trained to learn how to become uh, the business side. And uh, we meet again every other week when it's a series of programs. Uh, you're paired up uh, with this case with an entrepreneur in residence who's experienced, um, somebody who has started companies before that will work with you in the off weeks on a personalized basis about your startup. And our whole goal at the end of that is to get to the point where you can be funded either through the angel investors or through one of these funds. In that case, uh, there's a $50,000 stipend, uh, which your partner must match. 
Uh, this frees up the post stars of the dock so that there's no conflict of interest from the intellectual property. So Reed is actively involved in the NSFI Corps as well as the uh, Innovation Fellows, and this is where we have a blend of crossover. I tend to work primarily with the students where CMU does not own the IP, but we have a number of faculty that have developed some products on their own, which it actually it doesn't matter to do any work. So those are the three main ones, and I have some literature here that kind of describes more, and I think Dave's going to fill in for some of the rest. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just come at it from a, from a high level and be able to answer questions uh, on specifics. Um, there, are, there are three levels, I think, of services that we provide to entrepreneurs, and that could be undergraduate students, graduate students, alumni. Uh, this is a large community uh, of Carnegie Mellon people. It also includes staff that might work at SEI and may not have a Carnegie Mellon academic affiliation. You're part of the family. Um, the first is education, right? There is at the core, there are courses for credit that are here at the university, but not everybody can get access to them. So we do a lot of experiential learning. We have a, a workshop called the Connects Workshop, which today we had one of our business professors talk about negotiation, right? And how as an entrepreneur, you're going to be constantly negotiating and you've got to become good at it, right? Uh, Michael Madison was here from the ITI and uh, Kit works very closely with them in creating a program called Smart Start. And uh, we have one of those almost every week throughout the year on various topics to com company formation, to IP management, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of education that everybody needs. <coughs> You're gonna be an entrepreneur, you need to be a lifelong learner, right? You need to be a student of the game. Um, the second is access to expertise and talent. Um, obviously, Carnegie Mellon is a, is a you know, fountain of talent, um, but Experience matters, and, and we've created a network of mentors and coaches and experts that you can gain access to. And then the third broad area is funding. And we start at the pre 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 seed level <laughs> um, with things like the, the Spark Grants at Project Olympus. Um, you've heard a little bit about uh, the GAP funding. Uh, uh, our president, Barnum Jahanian, refers to the Innovation Fellows Program as gap funding, sort of helping to take steps to get it out of the university and into the commercialization. Um, one that I'd like you guys to know about, it's uh, we have a billboard over there called the Venture Bridge Silicon Valley. Uh, where's the money in the United States, in the world, for risk capital? It's largely centered in Silicon Valley. And guess what? We have 12,000 alumni in the Bay Area and many of them are successful entrepreneurs and uh, venture capitalists. So we have a program now where we take eight startups from CMU anywhere, here in Pittsburgh, CMU Silicon Valley, alumni from all over the world, and we do an incubation accelerator in, in the Bay Area for the summer to bring our entrepreneurial experts in and to bring investors in. To do that, we'll start off by funding you with 25K in the form of a convertible note, and if you continue to make good progress, there's another potential 25K available, right? So there's lots and lots and lots of resources. Like, what about the amazing people that you saw in the founders and the funders panel here, right? They all have some affiliation, some caring about Carnegie Mellon, and they are, you know, a text away, an email away, a phone call away, and they want to help. So take advantage of those resources. I'll make one closing comment and open it up to see if there's any questions, then we'll have a networking time. But the closing comment is, you want to keep up to date with all of the di different activities on campus, all the different pitch competitions, the accelerators that are coming to town, the investment events, sign up for the weekly bulletin mm -hmm. uh, from the Schwartz Center. Just go to the main page, swing me down on the right, sign up for the weekly bulletin. That's your main homework for leaving here today, is if you haven't already signed up for that. So any questions from us about the resources? All right, then we have some cookies and beverages, and we'll all be here for a little while. To get, get to know work. each other. If you don't know, go introduce yourself to somebody. It's your, it's your homework for the next 10 minutes, right? So I'll leave these just as a quick summary of what our services are. Yes. I uh, actually met with uh, David Brumley.